So tell tell it I've got it. Um, okay. So it is really an honor to be here tonight. Um, I am speaking with my favorite people. You get it, um, and you all want to do something about it. And so that makes me very excited to be here. But we do need to talk about this anxiety and um, how we stay on top of it and how we, as Julia said, use it for good. She's given me 20 minutes, so if I talk fast, we can uh, use more time in the question and answer um, opportunity to dig a little deeper on anything that uh, uh, is of interest to you. Again, um, you started with a land acknowledgement. Um, this is really important that we understand that we've got um, 11 nations here in um, Minnesota, fully autonomous nations and um, with their own uh, um, uh, laws and own customs, et cetera, that we need to respect. So just um, to start with my, a little bit about myself, I'm born and raised in, uh, raised in Minnesota. My ancestors are buried in Southern Minnesota. So I have really deep roots here. And because I have deep roots, um, I'm really attached to the land, love the land, have grown up um, really seeing patterns. Um, seeing how things were connected, saw um, the web of life. And I see that my picture is sort of freezing on and off. So um, don't let that annoy you. Um, and so seeing how everything's interconnected, that's very easy for me to see. That's how I perceive life. And because I see things that way, and because the patterns were deep parts of my history, I'm going to turn my video off because that's driving me nutty to freeze up. Um, because um, I, I saw these, um, these patterns and I knew the patterns, I began to see when the patterns started shifting. So things such as um, ice coming in on the lakes much later, um, the years that the robins didn't disappear, they didn't go migrate, they stayed here over winter. That never occurred when I was a, a young person. And predictably, the flowers bloomed at certain times. And now they're, they're not, they're blooming way earlier, not, perhaps not this year where we seem to have um, uh, not had a, a spring yet. But um, in previous years, um, they're starting to bloom faster, faster, faster. And so um, getting to my age where you have a little bit of gray hair and you've always lived in the same place, you recognize the patterns and that the patterns are shifting. The reason I tell you that is that if you have people who are coming, just moving here, they might not have as much cl climate anxiety because they don't notice that there's changes. So that's also factors into um, our level of anxiety when a place that we care about is changing so rapidly. Oh, here. Um, Teddy, why don't you let me shift the slides or Carissa, and that way you don't have to worry about the the thing. Eh, it'll, it'll get better. <laughs> All right. um, and so I want you to be aware of what's changing in Minnesota and be able to talk about what's changing so that you can really um, be knowledgeable about this. So our summers are actually cooling, which is sort of surprising given how hot last um, our last summer was but they're actually cooling and the winters are getting warmer. That doesn't mean that we're free of heat spells. We're having heat spells in the summer and they're extended periods and people can't cool down, which is really a nuisance to not be able to cool down. Winters are warming um, and we do have these polar vortexes and that's um, not an aberration. We're gonna have more and more of those, uh, which where the jet stream just draws icy cold uh, um, weather from the Arctic down over Minnesota. We're seeing more and more uh, floods and um, uh, very, very heavy rains, um, but the water runs off and um, our land sometimes has droughts. Um, uh, we're not having predictable patterns anymore. And then more recently, we've had a lot of trouble with wildfires um, and poor air quality from the West and Canada. Uh, allergy season on, on average is a, has increased about 21 days. So if you're thinking, gosh, what's the matter with me? I'm having trouble with my allergies and I didn't used to. It's because of climate change. Okay. So um, it gets real when you start to see it, when you see it in the skies. The name of our state is, um, is a Dakota word, which means the land of sky tinted water. And last July, we were anything but blue water. It was orange and yellow and a sickly color due to the uh, fires. I took this picture at Minnehaha Falls and you, many of you live in South Minneapolis and you generally do not see a heron standing on the edge of Minnehaha Falls um, uh, at the park there. But there was so little water going over the falls. As you can see below the rocks, there was just barely a trickle that a heron was able to stand on the edge there. 
that is wrong. That is a breach of a pattern. That is a, a, um, a indication that something is severely out of kilter. And there's actually a, a word that's been coined by a uh, Af, um, an Australian psychologist, Glenn Albright, which um, is called solastalgia. And it's a very unique type of grief and loss related to climate change or other forms of destruction of the land. And so unlike um, uh, nostalgia or melancholy, um, it is when a land that we love is um, destroyed or in distress. And it causes a really unique form of anxiety among us. So we know that these threads are breaking. I talked about the threads, the connection, the web of life, and we know that they're breaking and we know why they're breaking. Our population as a species has just gone through the roof. And that is um, in and of itself is not problematic, but we also consume are consuming it at an amazing rate. So not only do we have a lot of people, we're consuming at a very, very uh, quick rate. The last time that we lived in balance where we were able to, we were consuming what the earth was able to uh, um, renew itself or how it was able to renew itself was 1970. So 50 years ago, we were living in uh, balance with the planet. Right now we're going through 1.6 earths in order to, um, uh, in order to ha have a, a consume the way and live the way we're living. And we expend the earth's renewable resources right around September 1st. So we've got a problem here, excuse me. We've got a problem here and we need to be talking about it. And it's not just climate change. So that's where you're gonna hear me talking about planetary health and some of the issues that are intersecting. We're clearing the forest. There's massive biodiversity loss at about a thousand times normal. Ocean is becoming acid, um, acidified, land is becoming desert, oil, air, air, water ecosystems are being polluted. Now more, now and more and more, there's um, more and more data showing that we have all have microplastics in our blood. They're not quite sure what it's going to do to us, but it's showing up in human blood right now. Rivers are drying up, um, extreme weather events, the temperatures on the rise and sea levels are rising. And all of these have health impacts. Right now, not 100 years from now, not 50 years from now, but right now. And we are sometimes tempted to say with climate change, we're all in the same boat. But we caution people to really think about it as we're, we're all in the same sea. We're all experiencing the same uh, turmoil, but we are in very, very different boats. You're able to withstand a lot more if you're in an ocean liner or a yacht than you are if you're in a little canoe. So um, your whole everything that whether you're able to be re uh, resilient um, is impacted by our social determinants, our economic status, our race, the housing we, we have, our ability to relocate from a dangerous place to a safe place, our education, all of that impacts um, the impacts of climate change. And I would love to say it's getting better, but when the IPCC report was published in September, um, the UN General Secretary said this is code red for humanity. Code red is what we call in a hospital when the hospital's on fire or there's a hot fire in the hospital. So this is our house is on fire. I like to remind people as you look at this picture of this wildfire in Montana, that as you see the um, elk, elk standing in the river, this is code red for the entire planet. People are beginning to wake up. I find that very encouraging. So you maybe um, know about uh, the um, climate, uh, the, the Global Warming Six Americas. And this is a project of um, Yale and George Mason University where they study um, Americans, survey Americans, and they've done it. Um, oh gosh, I have, I think my original slide is back from 2014. So they've done it year after year after year to see where Americans um, uh, fall on this continuum. And in the beginning, very, very few were alarmed. Maybe some were concerned, some were cautious, but a lot were doubtful and disengaged. Now it's really swung over to this, which I think find as very good news. I find this very, very encouraging that over um, three quarters of Americans are concerned about climate change. We can use that to our advantage. So ideally, and Julia will probably speak a little bit more on this, we are trying to hit a very, we're trying to thread the needle. 
You want people to be worried enough about climate change and the other issues that we're seeing, all the other environmental issues that we're seeing, so that they take it seriously and take action. But you don't want to swing so far that you plunge people into despair. So it's finding that little, that middle ground, and it's not always easy, um, especially as people are exp exposed to the science and the information that's coming out. It's easy to move towards despair. But we also don't want to make it so late and, and everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it because it's not necessarily that everything's going to be fine. We've got to get going and start working on this. So you all know this young uh, climate activist, Greta Thunberg from um, Sweden, and um, she has very effectively used her emotions. So what we are looking for is being aware of our emotions and wisely using them in service to turning this thing around. And so um, Julia talked about that. And I feel that Gre uh, Greta is a wonderful example of how she's used anger. She hasn't used anger to throw a tantrum and destroy things. She's used anger to mobilize people and to help people realize we can't save the world by playing by the old rules because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change and it has to start today. Another emotion that you might be feeling um, in the midst of all this is, the, is fear, because the reports really do indicate that um, if, if we aren't really uh, making headway by 2030, um, we're going to see some processes in place that are going to be very, very difficult to change. There's going to be uh, feedback loops and patterns of the Earth's natural systems that are going to be very, very challenging to move. And so you can be immobilized by fear, or you can be, think about, okay, this is possible to make this shift. So if you don't remember anything I say tonight, I hope you remember these two slides, because I think this is really fascinating. This is Fifth Avenue, 1900, all uh, um, uh, horses and buggies, one automobile, Easter morning, um, 1900. Here's Easter morning, 1913, same street. You can't spot a horse and buggy. It is all automobiles. So humans know how to do this. We know how to shape and use um, stories and narratives to shift people's behavior. This one is my little guy, my little uh, grandson, uh, watching me give um, a talk uh, at, a, at a national um, a conference. And so I use love to motivate me. What will future generations say about us? I am doing everything I can so I can continue to look him in the eyes and say, honey, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm doing everything I can. And this, this from the Berlin Wall, you know, the Ber Berlin Wall absolute, absolutely looked immo um, uh, immo immovable. It looked like it wasn't going to come down. It was so aligned. But uh, in just a very, very short period of time, the people started dismantling the wall. So I love this quote, many small people who do in many small ways, do many small things, can alter the face of the world. And that is exactly what um, we're talking about here. So it's pivoting these emotions that could disable us into sources of energy and good. And I want to talk to you about a little bit about planetary health and how that inspires me to have meaning and resilience. So a little slow here. Whoops. So planetary health, it's a solutions oriented. So I like that. It's not just problem oriented. It's solution oriented. Transdisciplinary, meaning every discipline has to show up. It's not just healthcare, it's not just engineering, it's not just conservation, it is everybody has to show up in this massive social movement to analyze and address these impacts that are happening around the earth to the earth's natural systems and the impacts it's having on earth. So I'm gonna play a very, very brief video. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it fine through my system. <laughs> Planetary health is a new field and social movement focused on addressing the human health effects of the Earth crisis. Planetary health research teaches us that our dismantling of nature has become an urgent threat to our own health and well-being. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, and other forms of global environmental change are interacting to affect the core foundations of human well-being. 
from the quality and quantity of food we can produce, to the quality of air we breathe and water we drink, to our exposure to infectious diseases and extreme weather events. Every dimension of health is being affected. Safeguarding human health and well being and protecting the rest of life on Earth will require deep, urgent structural change in how we live and a global commitment to reversing our degradation of Earth's natural systems. Our growing awakening to this fact holds enormous promise. Looking out across the domains of global food systems, energy systems, manufacturing and the circular economy, and urban design, we see a rich landscape of solutions. We can imagine a world in which we have extended today's remarkable gains in renewable energy technology and moved to a post-combustion energy system, a world where we're producing food and manufactured goods with dramatically reduced ecological inputs, and a world where most of us are living in cities that have been designed to optimize physical, mental, and cultural health while allowing nature to regenerate. The moment we face calls for more than rapid innovation in our technologies and practices. Underneath the Earth crisis we have created and the global health crisis that it is precipitating is a spiritual crisis. The reverence and awe that most of us feel toward nature has lost its authority in guiding our decisions. We will need to weave a new fabric with threads from indigenous knowledges, the world's faith traditions, literature and the arts that reasserts our spiritual connection to the natural world and interdependence to one another. Our planet, our health, the state of Earth's natural systems and the well-being of humanity cannot remain disconnected. We know what needs to be done. We have the solutions. It all depends on what we decide to do right now, today. Please join the planetary health movement. So um, the planetary health, just a couple resources, and I'll make sure that you get these in the chat. There's an education framework. Um, this is a global, we had a group of global authors on this framework. And I just want to point out that we are asking people to rethink our connection with um, our understanding of nature. It's not that we are separate from nature. It's not that we have to reconnect. It is an understanding that we are nature. We have to understand that humans have caused this problem and um, own up to that. We need to um, make sure that any solution is equitable and we're um, talking about social justice. Um, that we think of in terms of systems and complexity and that we look at movement building and systems change. Um, last April, we were supposed to have our annual conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, but because of COVID, um, it was virtual. But we still brought together the global community, over 5,000 people, to uh, come together to say, what is our blueprint for this great transition? We need a fundamental shift in how we live on Earth, what we're calling the great transition. Achieving the great transition will require rapid and deep structural changes across most dimensions of human activity. And you can open up the Sao Paulo Declaration. I'll make sure you also have a link to that. Um, and it is a blueprint for all of us. So there's a blueprint for healthcare, a blueprint for uh, city designers, a blueprint for scientists. This is what it calls. This is what the global community calls the people on this call tonight to do. It calls us to create unity and solidarity among all people of the world based on our shared and common home, to expand our mindset and embrace ancient teachings and wisdom, to foster flourishing and a pluralistic society in harmony with the planet. It is calling us to um, fan uh, this, this desire for reverence and awe, and to be talking about the moral dimension of protecting all life on earth. And it calls us to use our organizations, our institutions, to educate, train, engage, and call into action. The global community has spoken. This is our uh, orders for what to do. 
And it is, um, I don't, I really want people to feel hopeful here. And Project Drawdown, which is really our science-based, evidence-based solutions for drawing down greenhouse gases, has figured out that um, if individuals make these choices and live these choices out in their personal lives and their homes, we can contribute or draw down 25 to 30 percent of the total greenhouse gas gases that are being produced. So I think oftentimes people don't get involved because they they think, oh, this only will happen if there's policy changes, or it only is going to happen if um, uh, big corporations make changes. This is calling us into action, saying individuals and families can be responsible for drawing down a quarter to a third of our greenhouse gases. So it is as though we're in this great tug of war for our future. On one side, our um, uh, powers that be that are well-trained, they know how to use media and social media, and they know how to use money, and they know how to use laws, and they, they are just on their game. And on our side, we're kind of um, a little sloppier sometimes, but we are full of grit and determination. And the beauty of our team is we can invite unlimited people to hold on to this rope and pull in the direction of survival and um, helping our planet and future generations. So I think you're all familiar with this quote, oops, this quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the, change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. And you are thoughtful, committed citizens, and it is absolutely possible for us to change the world. And we are, as this cartoon says, climate activists won't give up. It's like their energy is renewable. And not only is it renewable for climate activists, but people of faith, let me tell you, that's an energy that just flows through us and it keeps us going and renews us. So I will close on at that point and turn it back to Julia. All right, thank you so much, Teddy. Thank you so much, Teddy. Um, we are going to, um, we're gonna spend a few minutes here um, Let's take off the slides. I think the slides are off. Is that true? Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, um, so I am hoping that you all can. Um, for some, are you, guys, are you hearing feedback? Or mute Dinah. The... Um, can you mute everybody? Yeah. Um, Marissa? Um, okay, so what I would like to do is is um, get you to um, write, let's just write in the chat for right now. Um, if you have something you want to say, you're welcome to raise your hand, we'll call on you, and then you can unmute um, or ask to unmute. Um, but I would like to know, how are you seeing um, climate anxiety emerging in your community? Some of you work in... Uh, Green team, some of you work um, in a community space. Um, everybody is is out there watching uh, the fellow humans respond to the bad news about climate change. I think there was just an article that said 75% of youth think that there is um, not a um, not a positive future. Very um, hard to watch. But what are you seeing in particular in your communities that let you know that people are feeling anxious about the state of the world that Teddy was describing? So just take a moment and um, if as many of you as possible can put that in the chat, I would appreciate it. I'm going to just read a few of these and then I'll start commenting. Take another minute. So I'm seeing people say, um, uh, Diane, um, Diane says, I'm not feeling anxious so much as feeling futility. 
Um, I want to talk about that specifically. That's actually a, um, that is an outcropping of uh, what a lot of psychologists talk about as, um, you know, a sort of rational response to trauma. Um, there are greater urgency in climate activist campaigns. Stan, I'd be really curious to think about what that looks like. Um, I think there's a there's a big a desire for people to move with great uh, fervor and urgency, and so they're screaming, sort of like Leonardo DiCaprio did in that movie. You know, what the hell? Why can't you believe us? Um, you know, there's a lot of urgency. Not sure if it's directed well. Um, despair and anger in young adults, sadness, a lot of sadness. Uh, Teddy described that. If, if we know that things are changing in our world and we feel like we can't go home because home doesn't exist anymore. Um, younger folks are mentioning um, if they should have kids. That is something that I hear again and again. Um, Carissa, I know that that's something you and I talk about as we you know, are out there working with young people. You used to be a teacher. Um, but even in our own lives, it's a narrative that that is common. As we see other people suffering across the world, um, it causes us all sorts of different emotions. Um, immoral, immoral, we feel immoral sometimes. Immoral to bring kids into the world, immoral to um, to take a airplane flight, immoral to be living in the place that we're living, immoral to be happy, right? I'm, I'm saying that almost farcically, but truly something that, that people are, are struggling with. Um, there's a lot of denial going on, absolutely. Um, Carissa, you are going to have to share these. Um, you're going to have to make sure you you um, save the chat because this is like a beautiful um, set of thoughts. Um, it's motivated me to come tonight, says Rob, and also to work really hard on this uh, people's climate and equity plan. Super excited about that, that work. Um, Okay, so I want to share a couple of thoughts from some folks who are in the literature and I'm going to share the slides again. Let's see. Okay, there's my slides. Okay, so we just talked about this. How do you see climate anxiety emerging in your community? Um, so this is something that comes directly from um, a woman named Mary Pfeiffer who wrote a book called The Green Boat. Um, and she talks about how um, these are some of the things that she saw in her, that she's seen in her practice, right? Denying or minimizing reality, people do that all the time. Uh, sometimes we overemphasize our lack of power. Um, we feel like it's uh, futile or uh, to try because there's nothing we can do. Um, sometimes people deny their emotional investment. Um, sometimes people compartmentalize. Um, they don't act on facts. Um, they may feign apathy when they really are feeling it. Um, but sometimes when you feign something, it becomes part of who you are. Um, one of the things that we do in uh, climate conversations we have in faith communities around the state, we've done this with thousands of people in the last few years. Um, we talk about climate change and then we say in the middle of the conversation, we say, how does this make you feel? And the list is always the same. Uh, people are fearful, they're grieving, they're numb, they're angry, they're uncertain, they feel powerless. And sometimes they say that they feel powerful. And my question is always, how do we move people psychologically from numbness and fear um, to a sense of being powerful. And again, when, when we think about the word trauma, um, you know, we think of trauma as something that happens if you were, you know, encountered, uh, you know, as something that happened with great violence in front of your eyes, a war or something like that. Um, but Mary Piper tells us that actually trauma is something that you can feel just as deeply if you're lying in your bed and thinking about your teenager who is not accounted for in the middle of the night. 
or when you are sitting in an airport waiting to get to um, a loved one, but your plane is grounded and you can't be there when they need you. That those are things that cause trauma too. And so she starts to look at, you know, how is this, um, this feeling of grief and fear and numbness and anger that we feel in, in the climate crisis really the same? And how do we respond to, to, to trauma? And there's lots of great um, messages about this. Um, one of the things that you do when you feel out of control is, or like you, you have been traumatized, is you figure out how you can have some control. Um, so um, this is one of the American Psychological Association's key barriers to action, right, is the sense of powerlessness. So locus of control is the degree to which people believe that they, that they, as opposed to some external force, is the thing that's going to make a difference. Um, I show this picture here. This is our youth and power kids. Um, there's Analia um, in the center and Trey, and um, they are meeting every week. Um, up at Redeemer Center for Life. And these kids, uh, their program is called Youth and Power. The idea is to give them a sense of, you know, what are the things that they do have power over? So they make business plans and they sell light bulbs. They go and they uh, write letters and they speak to elected officials. They do door knocking, they do artwork. Uh, they do things that are gonna make a difference. Um, I think this is a pretty fascinating, um, uh, idea. Um, this is a book I just, there's an interview um, that uh, Bill McKibben has done with Sally uh, Weintraub, and uh, she wrote a book called Psychological Roots of the Climate Crisis, and she says that at this moment in history, uh, we have a real sort of problem with our modern culture, um, because we have a culture fundamentally of individualism and uncare, right? We don't care for the the you know the ant on the pavement we don't care for the tree we cut it down we call it a natural resource it's a resource um, we fundamentally are bombarded with images of people around the world who are suffering and we can't even function if we care too much about what's happening in ukraine or yemen or um you know wherever in the world the crisis is happening so we have a culture of uncare um, but when you combine that culture of uncare with this neoliberal, um, I think I spelled that wrong, sorry, um, exceptionalism, um, it is, it's seriously problematic because um, we are people who have been taught that we do have control. Um, and sometimes if we're taught that we have control um, and the only way to not have um, control is to not care, uh, we end up with sort of a toxic mess. Um, and so what we need to build is exactly what Teddy said, is connection, care, and bounded power, a place where we can be powerful within our own homes, within our communities. Uh, we can be powerful at you know, influencing Minnesota legislators, um, but we have to do that in a way that is not trying to um, exert some sort of uh, power over the situation that is like we have the best idea or the only idea or we're going to save the whole world um, because psychologically that's a that's a place that is dangerous. Um, this is another book that I've recently purchased. It just came out. It's called Bittersweet. Um, and uh, she writes about how we have this sort of aversion to sadness in our culture that if you feel sad, you're sort of you know, people think you're sort of maudlin and maybe, um, you know, crying is considered, you know, if you start to cry, people are like, oh, no, no, don't cry, you know, let me make things better, right? But actually, there's this, this uh, incredible power that comes out of having longing, which is the grief that we might be feeling when we think about climate change, um, combined with a feeling of joy that we experience because we love that other thing because we've created a culture of care. Um, so anyway, despair, um, says Mary Pfeiffer, is a crucible for growth. Um, so we need to be thinking about amazement and action as antidotes to despair. And some of that can happen by things like connecting with animals, right? Animals are always in the now. If you ask an animal what time it is, the time is now. 
Um, and you know, it's a wonderful way for us to, to be present in the world. Um, and ultimately we need to expand our moral imagination. Um, so how can we organize to bring power from our anxiety? Um, and I, I thought it would be fun and we probably don't have time to do this extensively, but even if I knew that the earth would fall to pieces, I would still plant a tree today. What, what, what is he talking about? How can we get there where we actually get people to do stuff on climate change, even if they don't know what the result is going to be, even if they truly embrace uncertainty and never have a, an answer. Um, so I'm going to just say a couple more things and then we're going to do questions. Um, there is a wonderful um, uh, network. It's called the Good Grief Network. It's a nonprofit that runs this 10 step sort of modeled on the 12 step program um, to personal resilience and empowerment in a chaotic climate. So, and you can take a look, accept the predicament, practice being with uncertainty, honor mortality. That's something that bittersweet Susan Cain talks a lot about a lot. If we, if we can't imagine that we're going to die. We really are missing something that's essential for humanity. Um, we have to really do a lot of work on awareness and bias and perception, um, coupled with gratitude. And then we have to be really kind to ourselves. We need to take some breaks and take care of this really precious organ that we have, our heart and our brain, and be thinking about how those, those um, connect and give ourselves some space. Um, and so I guess I'll just say, we keep talking about the three-legged stool at MNIPL. If you've heard us talk, you've heard about this three-legged stool. Part of the reason we do it is it forces people to be in different places, a powerful place, an uncertain spiritual, um, you know, loving place, a place where they can, um, you know, get something done and feel very um, much like they're part of something bigger than the whole. Um, so let's do some some questions and answers, thoughts, comments. And Julia, can people come off mute to ask them or should they put them in the chat? I and think this people for Teddy and Julia. Totally come off mute and ask the questions. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Nan. I'm from Champaign, Illinois. And Hello. so um, I, I put a comment in the chat about this book, um, but I've been an eco warrior for since 1981. So 40 years now. Um, and this book written by Joan Gregerson uh, a year ago, it's called Climate Action Challenge, a proven plan for launching your eco initiative in 90 days. And she's got a companion workbook that goes with it. This has been the most game-changing book I've ever read. She combines her knowledge in the renewable energy field as an engineer in the renewable energy field, also 12-step programs and uh, experience as a life coach. And uh, basically this is a plan for everyday people from around the world who want to make a difference, but they don't know what to do. It helps people get together, form a team, and launch a successful eco initiative in 90 days. And uh, Every year, Joan hosts the International Climate Action Challenge. And so I've been a mentor for the past two years for the challenge. And uh, as I put in the chat there, um, I worked with a team in, uh, in Africa with no money. I mean, I helped them uh, start a Kickstarter to raise $500 to get a used laptop. Uh, and in 90 days, that team uh, of, of a few young men in their 20s planted 150,000 trees. And so if a group like that can do that using this proven plan, I think that, I don't know, if everybody could, like would use this plan or would read it, you, it would be uh, amazing. So I just wanted to um, put a plug for this because I think this is- Thank you so much. Will you do me a favor and make sure you, um, can you also email it to us? Um, you can just respond to Carissa's invitation and so that we have the link to it. We'll put it in the follow-up email. Okay, it's in the chat too. So. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, all right, other questions? I'd just like to follow up on my comment about futility. Yes, please. You know, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of climate action groups and, um, and 
many of us, as all of us here, have been working on this for a number of years. And I feel like I don't necessarily, I personally, and most of the people in my groups, I, I perceive that there's not a high anxiety level. There's an insistency, but it, I guess for myself, I, I wane between like, is, this is going to take for, this is taking forever, you know, and is it futile? So, so I go through um, valleys where it feels futile and never ending. And then I, I realize that, you know, action is what's going to make it happen. So I can't stay in that valley for very long, but um, I'm assuming many of us are, are in the bottom of that uh, wave or in the valley <laughs> yep. in a tiny boat. <laughs> you know, I just want to, you know, that last slide, we didn't get to spend a lot of time on it, but you know, what has faith got to do, do with this? Like, why do we invest at Minnesota IPL and building a multi-faith movement. And I think that that's maybe part of the answer, right? Is that like sometimes when we're in the valley, uh, we need to know not only is there something much bigger than we are, but that, that, um, that we don't actually necessarily have control. So if you think about, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures uh, and the Christian scriptures as well, there's, you know, all these um, years where the Israelites are in, um, they've been exiled to Babylon and there's armies flowing over their land and there's all kinds of stuff that they're probably taking action in little ways. I'm sure they have some committees. They've got the water committee and the, you know, the like, let's find out what's going back at home committee and, you know, all that. But at the same time, you know, they're not necessarily winning. And so, you know, what do they do? Well, they remember and they sing and they, um, and they write gorgeous poetry, um, you know, and they think about the, um, you know, what it is to be human and generations of people come and go and, and die. And, you know, they don't, solve the problem. And I'm not, this is, that doesn't feel good. Right. But at the same time, sometimes we have to be really honest about that. And, mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm like really torn between two sort of, it seems like poor polar opposites, but they're not right. We have to be really organized. I really appreciate that book that you shared the last speaker. Um, you know, let's get a plan. Let's make sure that we have a bit of each of these things. Let's make some places where we feel fa powerful. Right. This is the, the three legged stool. Right. Let's 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 do that. And then let's make space for sitting back and being like, God, that was like a total nightmare. It didn't work. It, you know, you know, being honest about things, but also being, um, you know, making space for just loving. And so anyway, Julia, um, I put up on the screen blood root. I mentioned it earlier. Um, but I, I, I show it on purpose because I, um, today was one of the days where I was in the valley. I thought, holy cow, I've got to talk about hope and resilience and moving past climate anxiety. And, you know, with the news coming out of Washington, D.C. and everything, it's like, I am really not in a hopeful place. But I knew what could bring me back into my hope, and that was reconnecting with the land. And sure enough, these little, these little wonderful little flowers were just popping their way out. They're the earliest signs of spring, and um, they're ancient, ancient, um, uh, all tuberous uh, um, wildflowers. So I urge you, whatever it is that you need to reboot, to give yourself permissions to do that play with your children or your grandchildren, uh, run with the dog, uh, cook something that you taste and, and it, it brings you back into your body. Um, read a fun book, not just uh, climate action books. I am, I'm glad that was shown, but if our, if our bookshelves are only climate action, we're not getting a break from this. And whatever you have to do, go dancing, um, uh, sing a song, something that really pulls you back into, into a renewed spot because we can't operate on empty. We've got to keep our, our tanks full. Yep. I, there was just a, a really interesting, good uh, thought from Yordi. I just want to say something I felt was not touched on is how do you shift away from personal responsibility of individuals 
and think through systemic structures that make things like cl climate change possible. Is and there a way to reframe socioeconomic as one of the factors for feeling powerless? And I just want to mention why I talked about an individual is I just finished uh, correcting close to 30 papers, term papers from um, our students and Julia's in my class. And the number reason, number one reason they have not gotten involved before our class is because they didn't think they could do something as an individual. So we've got to titrate those messages of dismantling structures that are um, harmful in our society and things that people can do as an individual that are a little faster and somehow give our congregations, the people we connect with, that message that it's both. It's, it's absolutely both. But if you only say, nah, we've got to get the right people in power, or it's, we, we have to wait till we vote in November, that is really despairing when you're, when you're hurting right now. So, you know, one one way I think of that is I say it's it's important to think of personal action, individual action as like a spiritual practice. Right. I mean, like there's no rational reason why any of us would get up and go to a religious service every week, for example. And some of us don't, which is totally fine. But I mean, there's tons of things that we do that are not like strictly systemically rational, um, but we do them in order to be present and connected. And so I think that that the way if we think about ourselves as nested, um, nested beings, um, we want to do things that we know are internally consistent. And then we want to work in on systemic change. And we need to do that in a way that doesn't feel like if we don't win, that we have lost. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to be willing to say that we have to embrace, embrace uncertainty, and say sometimes we win and sometimes even our best effort is not going to work. And um, and that's that exceptionalism thing. Like we've got to get away from this idea that Western, you know, sort of thought has taught us that we have to be the, to find the answer or the right answer. Because there may be a million ways that things are changing and moving that we can't see or know or understand. But again, this is like why we just plug that three-legged stool all the time and making your action plan, right? If you're gonna make an action plan with a committee, in a in a group if you're going to put structure on your committee make it in such a way that there's a little bit of the spiritual work and a little bit of the individual practical stuff and a little bit of that systemic change so all of those are mixed into the pot together we found it's just an ex a very important recipe for uh taking the anxiety and sharing it and dissipating it and making it deeper so that we can do that love at the same time that we fight for change. Mm -hmm. um, Carissa, you have some opportunities to share with people. So why don't I hand it back to you? Yeah, um, I see a couple more hands. So I'll try to do my final plug uh, before we say goodbye super fast, um, because we do want to respect your time and get you out to enjoy the lovely evening. But um, I'm also happy to stay on if people want to continue to converse after the end. Yeah. Um, but I think really, you know, listening to so many of these thoughts of, you know, how do we address these feelings? How do we not also, you know, blame the individual, as was said in the chat, which I resonate with so much, where, you know, we were born into the system and we know who the culprit is, right? <laughs> it's the fossil fuel companies. It's the people who have known about the climate crisis for decades and actually lied to the public about it and are influencing our politicians to, to really not make the change that you know, we need. So anyway, with that in mind, um, systemic action for me is something I'm really inspired by. And I see it's so important. We need to make practical change, but we also need to change the system itself. And so that's why I'm going to share in the chat one last link with you all. And that is a simple little Google form. Uh, you'll get this in the follow-up email tomorrow. So you don't need to click on it tonight, but if you want to, that's fantastic. Um, and it's just sharing that you might be interested in helping do some get out the vote efforts with us this summer and fall, because surprise, surprise, we have a really, really important midterm election coming up. Uh, m and does nonpartisan work, but we do really important work of helping get out the vote for, with values in mind, with climate justice in mind, and also just making sure people know, hey, it's a really important election. 
We hope you vote. We hope you vote by mail. We hope you vote early, all of that. So there's really simple questions you can fill out. Just if you or your faith community might be interested in um, helping be part of these efforts, um, we'd love to just know. So you'll be well, hearing wanna, more from us very soon. Oh, yeah. I, I want to put a quick plug in for this. This isn't just getting out the vote, like dragging people to the polls, getting yes. them out. This is about, we're going to have a deep canvas that we're going to be organizing through congregations. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we're going to listen to people. We're going to talk to them about what they care about. We're going to hear their anxiety. We're going to hold it with them and we're going to help them to feel a little bit powerful by being part of uh, the democratic system. So anyway, it's going to be a very- democratic, Not the democratic party, the democratic system. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, but I'll stop sharing. Um, that was our kind of plug uh, for you. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for spending this time together. Um, I hope that, you know, hearing other people's anxiety, big feelings, frustration, confusion, fear uh, helps you to remember you're not alone. None of us are alone and we're all in this work trying to figure it out together. So um, we can definitely stay on uh, for a little bit. I see a couple more people have some questions, but again, if you need to hop off, we totally understand. We'll just stay for maybe one or two more questions. So thank you so much, everybody. Really wonderful to be together. Um, and maybe Cheryl, why don't you um, come off mute and then maybe Kathy. Thanks, okay. Everybody. We got to meet. Christelle Porter from the north side of Minneapolis, who's an environmental activist in the black and underserved community. And she gave us an extremely powerful presentation on what climate is doing to the people who live around her, who live in houses with, that have no weathering, weather stripping, that leak energy, that cost them too much. And so there's this whole world of work that we can do that can help make people's lives better in our own community and save fossil fuels at the same time. And I think that's a piece of coming together that we haven't heard here and that maybe is something to try to build on because she really understood the very fine grained nature of what her neighbors and friends are facing. And those are things that those of us who are more resourced could help solve as an ally to an organization like hers, not leading, but following and helping. So I just wanted to mention that side of the income inequality piece that we might wanna think about. Um, I wanna to respond to that real quickly. Um, first of all, we know Christelle well and work with her. And, um, <laughs> and I think what she is offering us is, a, is an invitation to expand our moral imagination, right? Yes. Um, and yes, she's exactly. Offering, yep, she's offering us an opportunity to to care in a little bit of a different way and not have to travel across the world to do it, right? I mean, we can we can be family within this when within this town. And so anyway, um, I love that. And Christelle is such a. Um, it, I just want to say, you know, one thing that I I love about humans is that each of them has a different sort of constitution and brain chemistry and like way that they interact with the world. And Christelle is um, this amazingly positive and hopeful, creative person who's just never going to stop with the solutions in her mind. And and it's just a it is um, such a joy to be with somebody who has that um, to offer us. Um, so anyway. And um, just one more comment yeah. about her. We sort of had an Earth Day festival in our social hall yesterday in which we gave people 15 different solutions they could try and ask them all sorts of, we, it was a lot of stuff going on. But Christelle learned about it and, and we said, do you want to come? And she came and just engaged with people and talked to them and explained things and stuff. And so she's completely willing to partner and nobody should feel afraid of just reaching out to her and saying, how can we help? And do you want to talk to us and teach us? And Yep, beautiful. Chris. Or I think Kathy. Oh, Kathy, sorry, Kathy. Hello, yes. <clears throat> hey, Kathy. I, hi, hi, hi. Good to see you. Hi, Kathy. Yeah, it's so oh, nice to see wonderful you. to see you, yes. I just wanted to highlight the quote that I put in the chat. Um, a direct quote from evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who said, we will not fight to save what we do not love. 
And I truly think that at the heart of so much action that I take and people I know, and certainly in my teaching of environmental science for many years, I found that many people don't have a direct relationship with other living things, with other, with other parts. I don't want to even say things. I want to say organisms or ecosystems or um, just direct connection. And I would take adult students out in the field and they would look for the, some for, they would say, I've never looked closely at any of this. And they began to marvel. And out of that, for me, comes also the ability to take action, but also the ability or the possibility to heal. Because just, you know, there's been research done on simply viewing nature and how that impacts our health. So um, I guess I, I tend to want to bring that into a conversation like this, because I think it's definitely a part of the the solution and the action and simply being with, with thinking of, you know, of environmental issues as all of life. And it's one thing to think that in your head, it's another thing to realize it in your heart. So I just wanted to bring that up. Mm -hmm. That's it. what the Planetary Health Alliance is baked into it, awe and reverence, is that is a key aspect of reconnecting and getting on the path we know um, we've left. Oh, what a beautiful way. Oh, Julia, go ahead. I was going to say what a beautiful way to close. I'm like, oh, I want to go outside now. <laughs> yes, we're going to get Carissa outside. That is the goal. Um, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, sometimes we work so, so hard on dead end ideas. And in fact, if we sort of reimagine our movements, we might be so much more successful. And I think that that what you've just offered, Kathy, is a um, you know, that's just one way with that all of us can be um, engaged in, you know, building a different character of the movement in a way that might just make things easy instead of hard. Um, so anyway, I love that and we should end on it. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks thank for staying on for bonus time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Teddy. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Teddy. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Did everybody leave? The most people left. Yep, we got Hi, Julia. This is Mary Beth Lorbecki, and I just wanted to say, Oh, hello. Mary Beth, how are you? Nice I'm to see good, you. and oh it's just been a long time, and this is just what I needed. I've been working on this Appalachian project, and with Mansion and everything, it's just like this 25 years as they worked and worked and I'm getting to the epilogue trying to say, well, what did they accomplish? And this is just what I needed to hear to help my epilogue. And your story of Exodus is just what I needed to hear. And just this whole thing and all these resources, um, it was just fabulous. And there's so many people I wanna share this with, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And you're doing incredible work. You just have, from when I last saw you, just things have just, gone so far and I hope your kids are well and you know they are well oh and you know it is like um what is so amazing about doing work that involves building a movement is that the movement when it's successful tends to itself right and it brings me energy when I sort of need to stop I actually had a really hard winter I I, I sort of fall into depression once a, a decade and you know it's just, it's really important to have lots of energy moving. Yeah, well, and I'm, I'm actually planning a reunion for activists who fell apart and were angry with each other for like 10 years because as all these people died in the movement. So we're trying to bring people back together in Appalachia and on Kafer Mountain. And um, um, I, other people are waiting, but I just wanted to tell you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's whole, um, everybody's chat too was just fabulous. Absolutely. I one thing I've got to do before I do anything else is save the chat because if it was to go away, I would be like heartbroken. Yes. Got to make sure um, I can do that. I'll let you talk to the others. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. All right.
I think Chuck, I wanted to just say hello to you. Are you still there? I don't know how to save the chat. I'm trying to figure that out. Save. Save chat. There we go. And 